good morning students today we'll start our session on introduction to ethical hacking first of all what do you mean by the term ethical hacking we do it with the in an authorized manner right with the permission of the organization so that is very very important whenever there is a deviation in the authorization it becomes unauthorized access so that becomes unethical so everything we are going to do in an ethical manner so that's more that's the essence so today we will be starting our session on introduction to ethical hacking every organization you take any mnc or a startup will require a form of testing called as penetration testing now this penetration testing is used to check the security controls of an organization whether they are strong or weak or any weakness is there in the security like take an example of firewall have you all heard about firewall yes what is a firewall firewall is used to filter out the packets which are entering inside or going outside the organization the more stronger a firewall the more security of your organization yes right so it is very important to test all the security devices of an organization it can be a firewall it can be an antivirus software it can be anything right so today uh, we will see the introduction and today's agenda we will start with cyber crime statistics of 2023 uh, what is the prediction right for the next few years in the world of cyber crime and we will see some of the terms and ter terminologies of hacking what are the different terms we will see threat categories and attack vectors we will see different types of hackers and different types of attacks which predominantly exist in today's internet world right we will also discuss about the penetration testing we will discuss a widely used methodology called as cyber kill chain methodology shortly called as ckc cyber kill chain methodology there are different stages of ethical hacking we will discuss that a reconnaissance and footprinting this is one of the first stage of ethical hacking we call that as reconnaissance and footprinting we will go in detail step by step we will go so then the second stage of ethical hacking is called as scanning networks and uh, we will towards the end of the session i will give you a report on what are the top breaches which have happened in the past few years and which all you should be cautious about right so this is about the uh, session today so we'll start with the cyber crime statistics so what do you uh, what idea do you get from this particular slide there is a exponential growth right so when you see 2018 right till 2027 what is the prediction the cost of cyber crime is steadily increasing so because there are that many cyber crimes which are happening in and around us right uh, so you see some of the statistics here nearly 1 billion emails were exposed in a single year so the amount of attacks what is the medium which is focusing email lot of people are trying to target the emails of the particular user right and and it is affecting one in five internet users so the statistics is like if there are five people who are using internet every one person in that is affected to a email breach right so breach means what what do you mean by the term breach means there is some kind of uh, unauthorized access of data that's why we call it as breach see you would have heard about the triad cia triad what does cia stands for confidentiality integrity availability right so whenever there is going to be some abnormality or some abnormal event which is happening that we call it as incident okay anyway i'll tell that at a later point of time just remember two key words one is called as incident another is called as breach we will discuss that in detail in the coming up slides so the second statistics tells that 
you have 236.1 million ransomware attacks happening, right? Have you heard about this term ransomware? It is a malicious software, right? And uh, how does it work is, this ransomware, we call this as all these files will be encrypted. How the attacker will perform this ransomware is, see you have some confidential data with you. That data will be encrypted by the attacker because he has done some unauthorized access on your system. And you all know in cryptography for encryption we have a key and for decryption we also have a key. Unless the attacker gives the key, okay, you cannot decrypt that particular data. So, the complete data is encrypted by the attacker and he will demand a ransom amount of money. Unless the victim does not give that amount back, okay, he will not give the key to you. So, that methodology we call it for, use it for a ransomware, okay. So, so, when you come across this term, just remember encrypted. The data is going to be encrypted. And one in two American internet users have their account breached in 2021. This are, these are some of the statistics of the past two years, right. So, 39 percent of UK business reported suffering a cyber attack in 2022. You should understand that I have taken two of the important countries, US and UK, because they are developed countries, but still they are suffering cyber attack. Then understand what are, uh, think how much will be the impact on think country India, right. So, we are vulnerable to cyber attack. And I think most important statistics is the most common cyber threat facing business and individuals is phishing. Have you heard about this term phishing, right? What is phishing? You try to create a fake link and try to attract the victim, right? He assumes that this is going to be a legitimate link, clicks that particular link and all his credentials are hijacked. So, that is called as phishing, right? So, phishing is also one of the most important type of uh, cyber crime and it is happening widely all over the world, right. So, so are you able to understand the basic terms, right? What is phishing? What is ransomware, right? So, we will quickly move to the vocabulary. Vocabulary is very important. Uh, what is called as hack value? Hack value, see why do a person attack? Mainly for some monetary benefit. He wants to get some money out of it, right? So, the the data which he is going to attack, how much worth it is, right? So, that we call it as the hack value. So, the perceived value or what is the worth of the data which will be demanded by the attacker to the victim. So, that is called as hack value. The next term vulnerability. Vulnerability means it is a kind of flaw or a weakness, right? So, some weakness will lead to a attack. So, you have to first identify what are the vulnerabilities in a particular system, right. So, the weakness can be there on the design of the particular uh, product or project or it can also be on the implementation part, right. Take an example, people develop lot of software projects. You would have heard about full stack implementation, right. So, people develop a backend. Unless secure manner, there will be definitely a vulnerability, right. So, the design. So, how do you design a particular uh, project? So, take an example. This is a website. I am going to design a website, right. So, you have two important fields. One is username, another is password. I have to check whether this username field is also validated. The password field cannot be injected by some attacker. Right? So, this is with respect to the design and implementation of a particular website, right. So, it is very important when you design any kind of project, vulnerability must not be there. Vulnerability, right? So, threat. Threat means a 
and explo exploitation of a vulnerability, right? So, so there is some problem, okay? So you have a problem and you attack in that particular problem easily the, you can get in, right? So that's going to be threat. So here is the vulnerability and you exploit this vulnerability, it becomes a threat, right? So then exploit means, what do you mean by exploit? How I am going to get access inside the system? That is called as exploit, right? So how are you going to get access? Already we mentioned in the previous one, through the flaw, through the vulnerability, we are going to get access inside the system, right? So that's called as exploit, right? So now, the next term is payload. Payload is the kind of executable code. See, there is a vulnerability and you use a threat, go inside this and do some code execution inside this. That's called as payload, right? So you do some code execution in the form of executing a malicious software. Have you heard about So you use the word and you it's a form of payload execution, right? So and similarly, once access inside this particular victim's computer, you go inside and delete the data. You use some you use some code to delete all the data inside the victim's computer. This is also a payload. You would send some spam emails to this particular person's system. That is also a payload execution. Right? So what you actually do on the victim's computer is a kind of payload execution, right? So then the important term is zero day attack. Zero day attack, you would have heard about it, okay? Uh, this zero day attack occurs before a vendor knows about it. See, now I developed the software. So patching means fixing the vulnerability, right? So I'll give you an example. Assume a particular 1.1. is going to be on the period between, okay, the patch happens and once you have identified, right? So that's called as zero day attack. I don't know about the problem, right? And until the time I patch it, what we call that attack as zero day attack. If I have patched, it is no more. Than you got the point, right? So this is called as zero day attack, right? So we will quickly move on to the other vocabulary called as easy chaining, also known as piverty. You would have Gaining access to a network, you get access to a network, right? And from that, you try to get access to multiple other networks. That's called as daisy chaining, right? So from one play, one network, I get access to multiple networks. That's called as daisy chaining. It's also called as piverting, right? Doxing, publishing any information about an individual called as PII. PII stands for personal identifiable information. Can you give some examples of personal identifiable information? PII stands for personal identifiable information. My, is my PII. Okay, I don't want it to be revealed to anybody else. My address, okay, my uh, my Aadhaar number is my PII. Yes or no? Right? I don't want it to be known publicly to other people. Right? So if anybody is publishing certain PII about a particular individual, what you call that as? You call that as a 
doctor. So, with the malicious intention, okay, it is not a normal intention to do some harm to the individual. If you are publishing some content, we call it as doctor, right. Now, I told you remember two terms, one is called as incident, other is called as breach. Now, let us see the definition of what is incident and what is breach, right. Incident means a precursor to a breach. Precursor means which happens before, right. So, precursor is going to be happening before this particular breach. So, the three triads, CIA, if any kind of, um, any kind of compromise happens on this that's called as incident. Okay, you try to do any kind of compromise on the CIA triad, right? Next, breach when it will happen after the incident. Breach will happen after the incident. Your data gets leaked. Your data gets stolen. So that's called as breach. So remember the difference. So incident is going to happen before, and it is going to happen after the incident. Any doubt till here? Are you able to follow? Right? Okay. So, what incident? So, rem always remember what are the, when I talk about activity, what are the three types of compromise will happen here? CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Compromise on any of these three can be termed as an incident, right? But a real harm. Daisy chain. Okay. See, first of all, you have some information, you go and get access to one network. Now, take the example of Shivnadar University itself. There are two departments. If I take one example as Department of CSE and Department of IT. First, I get access to Department of CSE with some information. From that, I get access to Department of IT using the same information. So, you get access to multiple networks, right? So, first entry point is through Department of CSE, but but now you are traversing to department of IT and then you will go on to multiple other networks of the same organization. Right. So, that's all that. so, so make a note of this. So let's see the different types of threats. Threats are widely categorized into three verticals. Okay. One is called as network threat, another is called as host threat, the third one is application threat, right. Uh, network threat, information gathering is the first type of threat where you collect some information about the network, right. Uh, I will give you detail. I think you already had a session on Wireshark, yes, right. What type of information? No, okay, okay. So you have not had a session on Wireshark, okay. So make a note of it. Wireshark is one of the widely used tools to collect lot of information, right. So, you collect information about a packet, uh, the header, the data, you collect lot of information about the flag. We will see that in the uh, later slide. Uh, uh, we, we will see what are the different types of threats we have. Information gathering, you gather some information about a target. I want to collect the IP address, I want to collect the, the uh, number of services which are running on that particular IP address, what are the ports which are open in that IP address, all these are some examples of what you collect from the uh, information gathering, right. So, sniffing, okay. would have, let me give you one example, you would have heard about this man in the middle attack, yeah, you have a client, right, you have a server, you have an attacker in the
always remember. It will be your passive attack. Passive will get gradually changed into active. How do you change? Now, client is sending some data to the server, right? And after continuous monitoring of the data, I will bypass. I totally bypass the client and now the attacker will act like client. This is called as the active attack. Passive gradually got changed into active, right? No more the real client exists. This attacker is impersonating as the real client. So all this, so passive will happen first, then the active is going to happen, right? How it happens is by sniffing, right? And now eavesdropping means actually you are, again, sniffing and eavesdropping is looking into the channel, looking into what type of communication is actually happening, right? Then you have DNS and ERP poisoning. Have you heard about DNS? Domain name system. Give me an example of any domain name system, for example, Google, right? It's a domain name system. People will try to, uh, you would have used, you would have come across the GoDaddy, uh, right? They really host the website, right? So people will try to create a similar DNS from that, okay? And they will try to spoof the particular DNS. That's called a DNS poisoning, right? And similarly, we have ERP poisoning. ERP poisoning means where you spoof the MAC address of the system. Every device has a MAC address. Yes, you try to spoof the MAC address. Okay, just now I gave you this example, right? The man in the middle attack. Now, the attacker is spoofing the MAC address of which device? Client, right? So he is spoofing because he is going to act like the client. I am spoofing the MAC address. So the server will think the attacker is actually the real client, right? So that's called as ERP poison. And man in the middle attack, I have already given you an example uh, DOS, denial of service. Distributed denial of service. DOS is where what kind of uh, triad is compromised in uh, DOS? C, I, or A. What is compromised for DOS? Confidentiality, integrity, or availability? Availability, very good. Right? So, availability of resource. If you are trying to do a malicious activity with the intention of tracking the resources of the victim, it is called as what type of attack? Denial of service. So, so give me one example of this. See, I try to crash the IRCTC website during the tactile preservation time. Because usually during the tactile time, what will happen? The server will be very slow. Have you come across that, right? So very slow. So the load, it cannot take the complete load and you try to crash the server during that time. Right, so delay a lot of What is the main difference between DOS and DOS? If you attack with a single source, it is DOS, multiple sources, it is going to be DDOS, right? So, see this example, one attacker, we have so there are multiple systems, now this is going to be the victim, right? The victim will never know whether this was the source or this was the source or this was the source. Yes or no? It can source can come in any hierarchy, right? So distributed denial of service is where the multiple sources together attack the victim, right? There are some password based attacks, right? You would have uh, tried this activity in your uh, college, right? So you want to log in in your friend's office. What you will do? You will do some random combinations, right? Either giving the date of birth or some kind of uh, words which they frequently use. So you try to use the brute force mechanism, trial and error mechanism, so that you get inside the login page of a particular user. These are all password based attacks, right? Then we have firewall and IDS attacks. Already you all know what is a firewall, right? So that is the device which filters the traffic if I am trying to directly hit the firewall, okay, that's going to be a firewall. What does IDS stand for? Intrusion Detection System. IDS is also a type of firewall, right? 
So this IDS can also filter the packet and it can also give some kind of alerts. Alerts can be generated and it will tell you like what type of uh, anomaly to the user. For example, uh, right, whether it's a dot, it can be notified to the user. So this packet is a type of dot, so please try to block this particular packet. So that's going to be and session hijacking. Have you heard about this session hijacking? Yes. What do you mean by session hijacking? Okay, first of all, what is a session? You log in inside your Gmail account and the time it takes till you log out is considered as a session, right? Now, when you log in inside your Gmail account, and you don't do a proper logout, you would have noticed that the next time you open your browser, automatically the inbox page comes directly, right? So that is actually called as broken session management, this one. Let's make a note of that, okay? Using this particular, if you don't log out properly, all your cookies, using the cookie information, anybody can see. So that's going to be a broken session management. Now, coming to session hijacking is where you are inside one session and completely your details are getting redirected to some other attacker's website. So your session is completely hijacked. Again, they, they will use the concept of cookies. So remember that. Cookies will contain what? Cookies are some temporary internet information files which contain the user information. Right? So they will contain the username, the password, so all those information all the sensitive information actually will be stored in cookies. So that is why it is always advisable you clear the cookies every week, right? Okay, if you are using some uh, public computers, it is advisable that you clear the browser history so that no cookie information is present inside your web browser, right? So these are all some of the network threats, right? So there are some host threats, like password tracking is, yes. Sniffing, actually it will be passive, completely passive, right? Eavesdropping is somewhere I may send some random packets and see, okay? So I will just see, okay? It's a type of access, okay? Sniffing is completely passive. Eavesdropping is also very much passive, but the behavior is slightly different, not much different, okay? Sometimes you may, sorry, sometimes you may send a packet occasionally and see how it behaves, right? So that's going to be eavesdropping. So, uh, coming to the next category of threats, password tracking, right? So, again, remember this term, um, credential shuffle. Credential stuffing means stealing the credentials of a user. Right? I remember in the previous slide, I gave a design, I gave username and password field. I want to steal the username and password in an unauthorized manner. That's called as credential stuffing, right? So how I will do this credential stuffing is using a phishing concept. What is phishing? Already we discussed in the previous slide. I will send some fake link. You will assume that is your Indian bank's authorized transaction page. Assume you are getting an email. Assume you are getting an email to change your uh, Indian bank net banking password. So the email is coming and the link is also coming. So you will assume that this is a trusted one. You go and click that particular link and immediately what is going to happen is you are redirected to a fake website and in that you will enter your username and password. But that is not the original website of Indian bank. But you are entering inside a fake Indian bank website. And immediately in the background what will happen is the username and password of your Indian bank net banking account will be stolen. So this is called as credential stuffing or password based attack. So people will use this credential stuffing by the concept of phishing, by creating a fake link, right? So now we already know what is malware. Malware means all malicious software, virus, worms, trojans, all are called as malware attacks. You insert, you install a uh, virus and try to execute. Footprinting is again very similar to information gathering. See nowadays lot of information is available in the social media. Yes, go to LinkedIn, go to uh, Twitter, 
uh, go to any kind of social media, you can collect some information of a particular user, where he is working, how many years of experience he has. And when he posts any photos in the Facebook or Insta, we know about his personal information, currently where he is vacationing, right? So these all are digital footprints. You collect some information on this and then try to attack the victim, right? So that we call it as footprinting. We have profiling is also very similar to collecting some information about a particular user, like he is working in which company, which department he is working, what will be the approximate salary of this particular person so that I can attack on his account, right? So profiling and collecting some information about a particular person, right? Then arbitrary code execution is also called as, check down, RCE, remote code execution. Now, uh, I think you will have a session on Kali Linux. You had it before? No, right, you will have a session. Kali Linux is going to be one of the uh, popular operating systems which is used to perform penetration testing, right? This Kali Linux has the feature of doing a remote code execution. Now understand this uh, concept, right? I am the client, assume I am client, I am residing in SSN, okay? And uh, there is going to be an attacker who is residing somewhere else. You know, remotely he is going to perform the execution on my system, right? So that's called as remote code execution we have lot of tools to perform this, right? So you can make a note of it. We have Metasploit, which is one framework. MSF is the short form, which is a tool available inside the Kali Linux to do this uh, remote code execution, right? There are other tools also. This is one of the popular tools, right? Now, similarly, what do you mean by backdoor access? Backdoor means, see, first of all, you should know that there are some entry points which are not checked properly by firewall. That through that entry point, the attacker will try to get access. That's called as backdoor access. So mostly people use some unused system and try to get access inside. So now uh, coming to privilege escalation, yes. M, I write it again, Metasploit framework. It is available inside Kali. You can also download it in other operating systems also. Put MSF in Google, you will be able to collect lot of information on this tool, uh, Metasploit framework. Next, taken a note of it, right? Okay. Uh, backdoor access, again backdoor access also we can do using Metasploit framework. Okay, lot of attacks we can do. Privilege escalation. Now, for this I'll give you an example, privilege escalation. Assume you are one of the user in a Linux operating system. I am a guest user, okay? I am a guest user. I have very limited privileges. I have only read access. I don't have delete access. I don't have updation access or modification access. Assume there is a root user or the administrator. He has all types of access. He has the read access. He has the write access. He has a, a delete access. Now, my intention will be to go to that root level. Okay, so I am having very less privileges. But if I go to the root user, what all I can do? I can do the updation, I can do the deletion, I can do lot of activities. So privilege escalation is from a lower level, you try to get an unauthorized entry into a higher level so that you can do lot of other activities. That's called as privilege escalation. Okay. So there are different types of privilege escalation. You have horizontal escalation, you have vertical escalation. Horizontal means I assume that I am an associate professor. I want to do a privilege escalation with another associate professor of my same category, okay? Vertical means I go to the professor level, one more level, right? So that's a vertical escalation, right? You can do any type of escalation and get the access. Code execution is very similar to remote code execution, right? So. So now we'll go to the application thread. There are a lot of application threads we have. Injection attack. You would have heard about SQL injection, right? This is one of the popular type of injection. SQL, you write some improper queries on the username field and the password field. Remember I gave you a design diagram, right? So you take this particular and you try to inject 
Now assume this is going to be a username. The, the, the syntax alone I will tell you, later on you will understand. See the idea behind this SQL injection is, you will make the right hand side equal to left hand side so that always the condition is true. What will happen when you do a logical or F or uh, true? 1010, zero, one, zero. what is the output? True, always any one is true, the other is going to be false also, you will get only the true. That idea is only implemented in SQL injection, right? So the second half, 1 equal to 1 is not a conditional statement, it is an arithmetic statement. So always this value will be true. So whatever you give in the front hand on the first half, okay, the condition will be made to true in both username and password and you will be definitely able to log in inside the user, user account, right. So that concept we call it as SQL injection. Anyway, you will deal it in later when you have in the next week session, you have the web application attack. There you will see that in detail. But you just remember, you always make the condition to true so that it always gets executed. That's the main idea behind SQL injection, okay. So now, we also give improper data. See, there are two types of validation. Have you heard of, uh, studied the subject web technology, open source programming? you would have done some kind of validation. What do you mean by validation? Whether the input is in the proper format. Now I gave a improper input like or 1 equal to 1. That is an improper data. So if you check in your backend code, whether there is an, e whether in username, if you give or 1 equal to 1, if you do a regular expression matching, you can find out that there is a possibility of SQL injection. Yes or no? Do you know what is regular expression? What is regular expression? Checking for a part of your string is matching or not, right? So you can do that regular expression and filter out this kind of unwanted data, right? So data must always be validated. Data must be validated at two ends. One is at the client side, one is at the server side. Both the ends it has to be validated. Otherwise, there is a possibility of an attack which can happen. Now, if I validate the data, whether the SQL injection will happen? No. Because I can do a regular expression matching, I can trim out those characters from my form field, okay, from my text box, right. So similarly, error handling and exception. When you write a code, it's very important. Yes. Uh, yes. No, no, it should be or, or one year. No, and means how will it always be true? Otherwise, how will it go inside the, inside the, see, when will the, only when it is true, the if loop gets executed. It's like that. Otherwise, the else part, the people have written invalid password, invalid username. So, if it is the if condition wants to be true, then only I can go inside the login page of the particular user. So, the idea is, make the particular uh, expression true, so that you go inside the login page of the user, okay. If it is false, I will not go inside the login page. It will give me invalid username and password. Please check your username again, right. That's why I am making the condition, okay. So that's why I am using the code, the expression or. So that even if one is false, this one equal to one will be true and always it is going to be true, right. So that's the main idea, right. So now, when we go for the hidden field manipulation, have you? come across this hidden field, right, okay. Today's homework, you will go and find out in HTML how to implement a hidden field, okay. What are the different form elements you have come across, you know, text box, text area, radio button, check box, everything you know, right. Similarly, there is also a particular type of field called as hidden. Input, this is how you write the code, input type equal to hidden. Find out how this works. This is the homework, you will do it today. You will write a code, you will write a HTML code on how to implement a hidden field. Now what is the advantage or what is the uh, problem in this uh, hidden field is it will not be available in the form. The text box is coming in the page, okay, radio button is coming in the page, but hidden field will not be visible on the page. So that any attacker will put some content and see Okay, 
will try to bypass, use that content and send it to some other page. Okay, if you write some content in the hidden, okay, that can be bypassed to a or sent to a source. That's the essence. Okay, so you please try to execute this and see. You will learn many things. Okay, input type equal to hidden. How it works? Already I told you what is broken session management. Yes. Okay. Uh, see you all. Yes. I will stay with some default values. I don't want the default values to be changed. You will change some values when you enter, but I will want the default values to be maintained when it goes to the server. So I will take from that hidden field. Alternative in the sense. Yeah, you can also use. See, I think you also have default as one particular uh, um, attribute of the text box. Also, you would have come across. Just explode, okay? Default. You can give some values. I think in the text box. If you would any open any particular web page, default there will be some values in the text box, right? That's because this particular option is enabled. Okay, you can also use this, but that will be visible, right? That will be visible when you open the web page, but this will not be visible on the web page. So I can use those default values. That is my values that I can pass in, right? See, whenever you have a web page, okay, you can right click on the web page and see the source code. Have you come across this, right? So I will try to inject some new things now. I will try to give a hidden field. I will try to make some modifications in the code. I will then send this code to the server. The server. Right, so that's how I inject some new value because in hidden nobody will be entering the values in the front end, but in the text box they will be entering the values, yes or no. So I will modify the code as input type equal to hidden so that it is not visible to the user, but I will make modifications in the code and send it to the server. I will use those parameters and do some malicious activity. Right, so that's called as hidden field manipulation. What is broken session management? Already we discussed, right? See cryptography issues. You already had some sessions on cryptography, right? What is this? What what did you discuss in the previous session? Cryptography. What is public cryptography, right? Yes. Types of cryptography, algorithms, right? Now, when there will be a problem is when you use a weak cryptographic algorithm, there will be some problem, right? So, for example, uh, TLS. What does TLS stands for? Transport layer security. Why do we use the protocol for encryption? Basically, we want to do some encryption and send the data. Now, assume that TLS 1.3 is the latest. You are still using TLS 1.2. There may be some problem. Okay, the attacker will use this vulnerability and try to perform an attack. Yes. So, yes, I'm going to sign So, we will. Uh, Cryptography issues ha happens when there is a weakness in the cryptographic algorithm. Right? So you use you don't use the latest version of that particular protocol, and that's where the problem starts. Okay. So SQL injection, you are clear, right? How SQL injection happens? What is the criteria? Make the condition always true. True, right? Then phishing. What is phishing? You create a fake link, making that look like a genuine link, and what phishing is mainly used for what purpose? What type of attack will happen? Credential shuffling, right? You take all the credentials, right? Now buffer overflow. What about this? What is buffer overflow? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. That's the very good. Okay. See, you have a limited capacity. In memory, but you are trying to hit more than the memory capacity. That's called as buffer overflow. Right? This, with respect to programming, I'll give you an example. C is very vulnerable to buffer overflow because it doesn't check for array out of bounds. If you give memory capacity as 10, still you can enter 12 values, and it will be going in some other memory spaces. No, not nearby, but it will be occupied somewhere in the memory. But C++ and Java are strongly type language. They don't allow this kind of feature. So buffer overflow can be overcome when you use C++ and Java. Okay. So information disclosure is again. What are the three triads we discussed? Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Whenever there is a breach, 
on confidentiality, it is called as information disclosure. See, you encrypt and send the data to the server. I am an attacker. I decrypted information disclosure. Yes or no? Because your cryptographic algorithm is weak, your key is very weak, so I am able to decrypt the data. So that is called as information disclosure. And there are some security misconfigurations we will discuss in the next slide. Till here you identified lot of attacks. Okay, so there are lot of attacks, and each of them has their own characteristics, right? So with the next slide we will. Any doubts till here? See if you seem that a little fast, you please let me know. Okay. Oh, talk for a bit. Okay. Now you know what are attack categories. What is an attack vector? Attack vector means the path taken by which a hacker is going to go and attack the victim. That's called as attack vector. Right. So the definition is how to get access inside the target system. So that's the call it as attack vector. And already I told you what are the terms called as payload. Payload means some code you are going to go and execute it on the Victim system. So we will see what are the different types of attack vectors we have. Uh, we have APT, advanced persistent threat. Check down this term. This is very important in today's world of uh, cyber security. APT stands for advanced persistent threat. Now, what is an advanced persistent? Stealthing is very dangerous. They are very dangerous actors. They will be very, very well mastered on hacking. They know all the ins uh, and outs of hacking. They will try to perform an authorized access. Like how you would have heard about China is spying on some country, right? So you can call that as an APT. China is doing some spy on the defense of a particular country, like any country. Okay. So they are actually doing an APT attack. They are very much. Um, Uh, they have a very good knowledge on performing the attack right so so you gain unauthorized access to a computer network and remain undetected for an extended period right so typically use a zero day attack now can you relate this term why zero day attack they are using because i don't want the people to know how to fix it yes do you remember the definition of zero day attack The vendor will not know he has released the software. Okay, until it becomes patched, it is called as zero day attack. So APT will internally use what technique? APT will use zero day attack so that the vendor is still confused how to patch this particular vulnerability. One who will know how to patch this vulnerability? Only the the APT people will know because they created the attack, they executed the attack. Okay, they will fix the attack. Maybe there are some ethical hackers who can do it, okay? But still, they will require some amount of time, and that amount of time will be definitely uh, more than the APT people, right? So next, you you would have heard about cloud computing, right? Cloud computing means what? You save all your data in the cloud, right? So you can have a, if there is a flaw in any one particular. Client application. Nowadays, you use the Google Drive, the Dropbox to store your data, right, in the cloud. And suppose, what is the guarantee that the data is safe there? If somebody tries to attack that data, that is also an attack vector. Okay, so the mechanism by which the attack happens is called as attack vector. So attack vector means how are you going to get access inside a system? One way is APT. Another way is by Cloud computing. Okay, so you also have different attack vectors. Right. So you know viruses, worms, and malware can also be an attack vector. They go execute and come, do their job. Right. Again, ransomware. You know what is a ransomware? They do their job. Right. Mobile devices. Nowadays, lot of attacks are targeting on your mobile devices. Yes or no? Right. So so they try to hack the contact, the messages of a particular mobile user. So mobile device threats are also attack vectors, right? So botnet. What do you mean by botnet? Again, it is a network of malicious software, not a single um, what, not a single software. It is a network of malicious software. So that we call it as botnet. Bot means single. Botnet means multiple. Okay, multiple malicious softwares are there which try to perform a 
attack right now you should know there are two different types of attack internal attack external attack what is the difference between the two internal means the person belongs to the organization he is a disgruntled employee i am not satisfied with the benefits okay and hence i am doing an attack right so that's an insider attack external means anybody x y z who is nowhere related to the organization is doing it. and surprisingly if you see the number of insider attacks is more than the external attacks that's because those many people are unsatisfied with the benefits of the organization right so insider attacks is one way see why insider attacks is, can be more successful any idea because he knows everything about the organization right so he will unwantedly disable the firewall what will happen immediately everything will come inside right he knows all the misconfigurations remember we had one thing called as misconfiguration misconfiguration means you can enabling can be disabled you disable something right which has to be disabled is enabled so you do a misconfiguration right so these are so now web application threats now you will tell me what are the different web application threats we discussed sql injection session hijacking all those are coming under web application threat okay where you attack a website phishing you already know right so you create a fake link iot threats again what do you mean by uh, an iot device is very uh, memory constrained device right so you have very less memory so you can easily uh, target that particular iot device for an attack so iot threats are also some attack vector okay so till now we have discussed the main threat categories the main attack vectors and we have discussed some vocabularies okay so we'll uh, close for a short break then we will start the next session okay any doubts till now you are able to follow if there is any doubt okay you stop me and let me know okay hackers different types of hackers see the concept is ethical hacking right so we have ethical hackers but there are also other hackers non ethical hackers so let's go from the bottom green hat hackers these are the newbie hackers or naive hackers just now they have entered into the world of hacking they don't know much they don't have much knowledge on hacking right those are we term as newbie hacker and they are not much aware about the consequences what is going to happen oh, they are not worried about that so their skill set is very minimum we call we call them as green hat hackers the next level as we go from bottom to top the level will be increased okay the next we have blue hat we term the hackers based on the hat color right so the blue hat hackers their main intention is to take personal revenge see uh, i told right insider attack you are not happy with the some benefits i will do blue hat hacking i will take some personal revenge from you right so then and also there there are some people who will uh, develop new software they will develop new softwares and test that particular software and they will try to uh, add in some vulnerability inside that particular software right see uh, you would have you should know about a particular tool called as solar winds this solar winds is actually a, a security monitoring software you just make a note of this s i e m you go and find out the full form of what is sim a popular tool for siem in industry is plunk and solar winds in 2022 there was an attack which happened on the solar winds siem it is a software actually it is a tool people are using it for security purpose right when there was an update which happened in the solar winds some person who worked inside the solar winds injected the attack so what they will think solar winds is actually a security software but it itself got converted to an anti security software so these all will happen so this will be done by which type of people this blue hat hackers they will create a new software new version of a software and release it inside right so then you have red hat hackers hackers who will use the techniques of black hat hackers okay so actually their intentions are going to be noble see in the films you would have seen okay there will be some heroes okay they will take the money from the villains and give the money to the poor people right the same way this people will be working 
okay so this red hat hackers their intention is noble but the path which they take is not correct that's going to be unethical or illegal route which they take to collect the information so that's the characteristic of this particular hacker now you have gray hat hackers who fall in between good and bad they are in between good and bad okay so i cannot term them either as good nor as bad so they fall in between good and bad okay and then they are going to penetrate systems without permission again they don't cause much harm that means they will not do much damage to the organization they will do hacking but they will not do any damage to the organization right so so they will try to exploit some vulnerabilities and they will also offer a solution see they will tell you okay see i have uh, i have hijacked your data or i have stolen your data give me some amount of money i will give you the data back so and they will be very uh, legal like on legal terms they will work okay so you give the money to them they give the data back to you so they are very much ethical in that terminology okay so now you have this is white hat okay so this is not visible here you take down the term this is white hat hackers okay they are called as the ethical hackers so who are all working in the company they are all called as what type of hackers they are actually the white hat hackers they are ethical people and see the only difference between all different types of hacking is they penetrate the system with the owner's permission okay to find and fix the security vulnerabilities and mitigate the cyber attacks no else you will find this particular definition because in all places if you see without permission without permission they don't get any permission from the organization but which type of people get permission only the white hat hackers will get permission from the organization assume i am a white hat hacker uh, an organization can hire me and they will ask me please check the security controls of the organization which are all weak which are all robust right and try to fix those vulnerabilities if there is any weakness if my firewall is weak try to fix it right so the white hat hackers will think in the direction of or think in the aspect of all the other hackers we'll see how they will do hacking and i will also try in that direction but i will fix the vulnerability so that there is no cyber attack which is happening so that i call those people i call it as white hat hackers right so now you also have black hat hackers again they are the dangerous people okay so they use cyber attacks to gain money okay so they will again penetrate without permission they penetrate without permission remember i told talk something about apt advanced persistent threat these are the people who will do that the black hat hackers are the uh, people who are very much skilled in hacking and they will try to do a state sponsored attack or a nation wide attack right because they are very much uh, skillful right and they also know the zero day vulnerability because apt again works on the principle of zero day attack right so black hat hackers are the dangerous people so we, so as a company person you should be standing in this place only so don't go to any other because that's not ethical and it's not advisable okay so now we will see how does the attack happen the attack can happen at different levels in the system okay the first level is at the os level you can attack the operating system directly because that is the heart of the system you attack the os everything gets crashed right so os i can crash it at one level so attack which target the operating system like you target the guest account right why we target the guest account is because they will not have much privileges they will be easily accessible right you remember the attack called as privilege escalation yeah first actually i will be guest then i will become root right so for that i should be first of all at least a guest yes or no until i become a guest i i first enter the organization as guest okay then i will move towards the root act so the first level of entry will be the guest account okay so you will first exploit the guest account and then later on you will jump the ladder okay similarly default passwords so people will always tell you whenever you are configuring your 
uh, organization email for the first time, you are given with a default password, but please change it when you use it for the next time, right? Why? Because default passwords are always vulnerable to cyber attack, right? So these are the two ways by which they can get entry. So as I told, so buffer overflow is one way of targeting the operating system because they are entering inside the memory, right? So buffer overflow is one vector. What is vector? The path which you take to get entry inside, right? Protocol implementation, right? So some of the protocol are, see you have the different types of protocols for OS like you have the shortest uh, path, right? You have uh, scheduling algorithms, you have a lot of algorithms, right? So any weakness in this protocol can also lead to a attack, right? So similarly, software defect. Just now I gave you an example of so, uh, solar winds. One security flaw can immediately trigger a vulnerability and it can lead to a cyber attack, right? So patch levels, what do you mean by patching? You fix, you fix it, right? So there will be patch levels, one, two, three. One, okay, so low, low effect, two, medium effect, three, what? Highest effect. So what the organization will do is, whenever there is an attack, they will try to first look for a temporary solution. So see, I assume an attack happens in an industry, okay. Immediately, they will not think about the future solution. Immediately, I should stop this attack. So that will be a temporary solution which works only for 24 to 48 hours, okay, that patch level will be less, right. When you look for that in that 24 to 48 hour span of time, I can think for permanent solution, right, that patch level will be high, are you understanding, right. So patch level depends on how long you can fix this uh, attack for, okay. So that is going to be the patch level. Authentication schemes, you would have studied different authentication schemes like uh, um, Kerberos, Yes or no? There are, yeah, these are all some authentication schemes which you use in cryptography. So mainly, uh, and uh, you also have different authentication schemes for Wi-Fi security, okay? See, you, nowadays everybody uses Wi-Fi, right? Again, there should be some protocols which protect your Wi-Fi access, right? So initially, there is one protocol called as WEP, which stands for Wired Equivalent Privacy. This was the first protocol which came to protect the Wi-Fi security now, and people were easily able to break it, okay. Like how first symmetric cryptography came, then asymmetric cryptography came due to some problems. Similarly, WEP came first, wired equivalent privacy. Those cryptographic algorithms which are being used inside WEP are vulnerable to cyber attack. So then came WPA, Wi-Fi protected access. It is still more secure than compared to WPA. Now currently people are using WPA2, that is the newer version of WPA. So this is like a hierarchy. So these are all some authentication schemes example I am giving you. So now I tell you, I am using WEP, am I secure or not? Not secure anymore. That authentication scheme is vulnerable to cyber attack. Still you are using that authentication scheme means you are no more secure. So which am I supposed to use now? WPA2. Understand? So authentication schemes, whichever you use should be the latest one. One more example I gave you with respect to another protocol what for latest one. What is that example? Remember the TLS one? You have 1.2 and you have 1.3. You are supposed to use the latest one, right? So application level can be the next type, okay? So attack on programming code, right? And software logic. Remember, so again buffer overflow as uh, she pointed out can also be used at the application level on the code, but on the code level, right? See, you can have some bugs. Uh, there can be uh, XSS stands for cross-site scripting, okay, take down. This is also one of the popular web application attack. Cross-site Short form, we call it as XSS. This is also a popular type of web application attack. In this attack, what is going to happen is they will inject some malicious script. This is going to be the syntax. Have you studied JavaScript, VB script? Yes, okay. So this is how you write a script, right? So you will write some content inside the script. You will 
do lot of activities inside this. Now, I am generating an alert box. So, injecting malicious scripts inside the web page, we call it as cross site scripting attack. This, this definition is enough for you, okay. There are lot of other types of cross site scripting, but for now, you, you can take it down as injecting malicious scripts inside your web page, right. DOS already I have given you the definition, SQL injection you already know, what is MITM, man in the middle attack, right. So, so, so attack types, they are targeting the operating system, they are targeting the application, right. They are also targeting the misconfiguration. Remember the misconfiguration which we discussed in the earlier slides, right. So, what is misconfiguration is, the attacker is going to take advantage of the systems which are misconfigured due to improper configuration, right, so or default configuration. Now, take this example, improper permission of SQL users, access list permit all. So what is the problem in this particular statement? So, have studied about access list, access list means how much permission should be given to different users. You remember the same example you always remember, the guest user and the root user. The guest user will have different permissions, the root user will have different permissions. Now, if I give this statement, what will happen? All users will have same permission, right? So, that is not valid, okay? So, this is called as an improper configuration. Even here, there are some examples of improper configuration like if you have the default values, that is not correct. You change your default password, one example, right? So, similarly, cloud settings, when you are using the AWS or any kind of uh, uh, cloud vendors, you need to change the settings, okay. So, too much of information in error messages, this also is not required. See, when you type a particular website, www.irctc.co.in, okay, if you get page cannot be displayed, what, what do you infer that as? The server is down, something, that is it, okay. But if you get lot of error codes, okay, sometimes you will get 404, okay, you get all the error codes, right. So, every error code has a meaning. From that meaning, the attacker will know what exactly is wrong on the server side. So, if you give lot of information on the error, that is also not required. So, when you develop any website, you should make sure that error messages should be not in detail. What exact information the user should know, only that is enough. If you give all the technical aspects, okay, 404, this is the error actually, which is in the technical aspect, if you reveal, that attacker will come to me. Okay, so this is all should be avoided, okay. Similarly, there are the deprecated protocols and weak encryption. I told you TLS, the example of TLS is 1.2 is deprecated, so we go for 1.3, okay. So, then shrink wrap code. What do you mean by shrink wrap code means? The process of exploiting holes in unpatched or poorly configured software, right. You know something is unpatched, then means the cyber attack can definitely happen, right. Anything it is unpatched, you are leaving way to the cyber attack to happen, right. So, for example, I told you, right, there is particular defect in version 1.0. What you should go for? Go to the next version 2.0. Fix that bug and release the new version, right. And similarly, CGI, what does CGI stand for? Common Gateway Interface. That is going to be like an intermediate between the client and the server, okay. Most of the attackers will try to target this script, CGI script, right, because CGA script, if you manipulate, that can be easily sent to the server and the attack can happen on the server side. They will not touch on the client side, okay. Client side, they will not touch. The intermediate, they will touch. That is the CGI part. That is the gateway part. They will modify the code here and then they will send that code to the server, right. Very similar to man in the middle attack, right. And then again, default passwords, we have already discussed about this, right. So, attack types are of four categories, okay at the OS level, at the application level, at the misconfiguration level, at the code level, okay. So, these are the four uh, types of attacks which can happen. Now, as I told you, now we are going to go inside the penetration testing because ethical hacking comes as part of penetration testing, right. So, in penetration testing, you are actually testing the security controls of an organization. When you are testing, you have different phases, okay. There are three phases of penetration testing. The first phase we call it as the pre-attack phase. Pre-attack phase is where you do the reconnaissance and information gathering. Reconnaissance means information gathering, okay. 
So the, the term used for information gathering is reconnaissance. Now, assume I am collecting the IP address of a particular target, I am collecting the port, all these will come under which phase? It will come under the pre-attack phase, right? Then comes the attack phase. Attack phase is where you try to attempt inside the network and execute. The real attack phase is called as what type of phase? It is the attack phase. You do the attack. And once the attack gets completed, you go to the post attack phase. In the post attack phase, you are doing some documentation. You are doing some report generation. Like what has been successful, what has not been successful, how to fix this, what can be the solutions, all these will be discussed in the post attack phase. So there are three main phases of penetration testing. You start with pre, then attack, then post. Okay. In today's session, in the next two hours, we will be discussing more on the pre-attack phase because if pre-attack phase is properly done, then the attack is going to be definitely successful. Most information, you know everything about the target, you know everything about the target system, easily you can execute that. So as much information you are going to collect in the pre-attack phase. Now if you go for an organization, you can ask for any of these services from the particular company, penetration testing services, right? So a lot of attacks if you uh, see in the cyber crime are happening in which sector? The financial sector, right? Banking, uh, the financial uh, insurance, all these are some sectors where lot of cyber attacks are happening. So you can go to a particular banking section and ask a particular company to do the penetration testing for a particular bank. Yes, they will do the penetration testing and give you, okay. So to, they will see what are the frauds which are happening. Again, you go to a company, ask them to do information gathering for a particular X company and give you some details, information gathering. DOS, we already know, okay. You go and ask a particular organization, okay, so they will try to hit and see whether your organization is vulnerable to DOS or not. How much strong is my server? I want to check that, okay. What is the maximum capacity my server can withstand? So I should actually do a DOS and see. Then only I will know what is the maximum capacity my server can withstand, right? So you can do a DOS. And 2FA stands for double factor authentication, right? So you can do a double factor authentication or interception. What do you mean by interception? You try to intercept and see whenever you forge a password, okay? That's why nowadays people are going for this. Uh, whenever you log in, you will get lot of CAPTCHA. Yes, have you come across this? This is also a type of authentication, right? And sometimes they will check whether you are a robot or not. You, they will ask you to solve some puzzles. Yes, so that the authentication is strong, right? So the more you ask for information from the user, the more is the security on that particular website, right? So you should always have a multi-level authentication. So only a password is not sufficient. Yes or no? Because password can be easily hacked you need to have one more level of authentication because otherwise easily anybody can intercept. Yes, right. So now, again, location tracking. See, in your mobile, if you enable the GPS, anybody can find out where you are. Yes or no? Okay. So nowadays, the mobile devices, the location tracking has become so easier that you can find out where your victim is, in which location he is traveling. Right. Call interception. So call interception again. Uh, you have something called as phishing, which you do over phone. Phishing is which you do on your mobile computer, right? You send a fake link. Somebody calls you and tells, yes, I am so and so person from an Indian bank. Kindly send me your PIN number. Something he tries to lure you. Uh, and then you try to give the details, okay? So that is, again, again, call interception will happen when a client and server are talking and they gather some Im communication from them. Some sniffing is happening. That is interception. Yes or no, right? So they try to track. So in the earlier days when we had landline phones, you remember when we will be talking, we will hear somebody else's voice. I don't know whether your gener this generation has come across this or not. But in the landline phones, we will hear somebody else also talking. Cross talks will happen, right? Okay, even in the mobile phones this happened. When we call to actually one number, we see that some other has attended the phone and he is talking, he is not the actual owner of that particular phone. These are all some kinds of interception. They do some kinds of traffic regeneration. 
that is redirecting the traffic to some some other place, right? So, so this is all about the, so mainly there are three phases of penetration testing. One is pre-attack, other is attack, the third is post-attack, right? So we will quickly move on to the methodology. What is followed in the industry? Yes. CAPTCHA can be okay. No, 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 here the problem is uh, we want to differentiate whether human is operating or robot is operating. Some people will do remote code execution to log in inside the machine, okay. But CAPTCHA can be learned only by a human, yes, that, that we were ruling out the possibility of remote code execution here. So automation should not be done there. So whether a human is operating or a non-human is operating for that purpose. Escalation. I discussed in the, you have to give me the answer now. Uh, privilege escalation you are talking about, right? See, privilege escalation is there. See, first of all, you have a guest user. You have some privileges. I will try to do a try, brute force entry inside the particular person's login. That's privilege escalation. See, you have lot of tools for that, okay? What you need to do is, see, for example, assume this is a website. Hmm? This is the username field and the password field. The username is admin, okay. Now password I do not know for that particular person. In the background you will run some tools, okay, with the text file having some 1 lakh passwords. In that 1 lakh password any combination of password is right means you will be able to log in inside. So you will try to do a privilege escalation. That means from your account, you are actually going inside another account. So that is called as privilege escalation. Got it? Okay. So there, see, you are not the owner of that particular account, but you are going to get the privileges of that particular person. Escalation means moving up. That is all. The actual meaning of escalation is moving up. Yes. Mm. Mm. Do you think that has happened anywhere recently? Yeah, maybe in the future it can happen, right? But right now, uh, in that case, um, we still have some new new techniques which are developing, which are evolving, okay? So that's why even the CAPTCHA should be like a random sequence. The machine can follow a certain pattern, okay? But it cannot understand the randomness of a particular person. So the more the randomness you give, even the machines cannot able to interpret. Hmm. Do you think it has happened? Then give me an example. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that can happen. See, I am not telling that see, CAPTCHA is one way of additional authentication. But that is not the only way of authentication, right? So if you use only CAPTCHA as authentication, you may be in a problem because machines can learn it and try to uh, use it in the near future. But I am trying to tell us add more authentication levels. One example of authentication level is CAPTCHA, right? So the more authentication levels you add, the more secure is your uh, website or application. So in that aspect, I told us one example as CAPTCHA. However, you are uh, if you feel that the, still there is a, some uh, uh, vulnerability or there are some weakness which can happen in the CAPTCHA, you can add in more level of security. That's always, uh, you can add it, right, at any point of time, right. So, yeah, we were discussing about privilege escalation. Now, we will go to a methodology called as cyber skill chain. Now, this methodology is widely used for identifying, detecting and preventing APTs. What are APTs? We already know, right. Those are sophisticated attacks which use internally the zero day attack concept, right. So there are seven uh, stages of cyber kill chain methodology, okay. First stage is called as the reconnaissance. What is reconnaissance? You already know, gathering the information. You gather the information, some examples I will give, give you is an email address of a person, the IP address of a system, the ports which are open in a system, the services which are running in a system are all examples of information gathering, reconnaissance, okay. And then, the second level is called as the weaponization. 
So first stage we have the reconnaissance, information gathering. Second stage we have weaponization. Now what is weaponization is you are going to deliver a payload or execute a payload on the target victim, right? So there will be some exploit. Exploit means see, um, are you are aware about different programming languages. Now take an example of PHP. Heard about this programming language, right? So in PHP, there is one particular flaw. If I tell, okay, that we call it as exploit. Do through that exploit, I will execute the payload. So people who are using PHP, if I know that they have used this particular code in their application, I will use that exploit and get inside the application. So that's called as exploit, right? So you are going to couple the exploit with backdoor into deliverable payload. What is backdoor? You get an unauthorized entry inside your machine. That's called as backdoor, right? So now third one is going to be delivery, right? How are you going to execute? Remember attack vector, the path which you are going to take. Are you going to execute this attack through an email? Are you going to execute this attack using website? Are you going to execute this attack using a USB? What is the channel by which this execution is going to happen? That is what we call it as delivery. How is the attack or how is the exploit going to get executed where? On the target machine, right? So then exploitation is the real execution. Assume you have in, uh, installed a virus. Until the virus executes, the virus is not going to be successful, right? The execution of the virus we call here it as exploitation. You are executing the code on the target victim. We call it as exploitation, right? So then installation is going to be, right? See, one, once one virus is successfully executed, you can execute all other softwares on that particular system, right? I can, uh, I can install some kind of, uh, you would have heard about uh, any desk. This is kind of a remote the desktop software, remotely you can access, right? So similarly some softwares I can install, remotely I will access that system. So all those will happen in the installation phase, right? Then uh, you have the sixth phase called as CNC or C2, command and control. Command and control means now your entire system is under my control because I remotely went inside, now everything is under my control. I can delete the files, I can copy the files, I can do anything on your system. That we call it as command and control, okay? So then actions on objectives, right? Now what else you want to do on that particular system? Whether you want to crash the data of that particular system, what is the goal? Why did you come inside this particular machine, right? So that is going to be the objective, what, whether I am able to achieve this objective or not. So to summarize, you start with reconnaissance, you go to weaponization, you do the delivery, you do the exploitation, you do the installation, you get control on the machine and whether your objective is solved or not. So that's going to be the cyber kill chain methodology, right? So clear on this, right? So now, as I told, uh, ethical hacking, there are five stages. This is very similar to the cyber kill chain methodology. I have reduced the seven phases of cyber kill chain into five phases. Right? So reconnaissance, right? You have the scanning. First stage is also called as information gathering. Scanning is for scanning network. Now take the example of same SSN or, or let us have the SSN uh, organization. So totally how many systems are present in the lab? How many systems are currently up? How many ports in these systems are open? What are those ports? whether FTP port is open, whether HTTP port is open, whether Telnet port is open. These are some of the ports to send that particular type of traffic, yes or no, right? So you try to find out, scan and find out the information about a particular network is called as scanning, right? Then gaining access, okay? So this first two will come in which part of penetration testing? Can you tell me? Free, very good, okay? Gaining, maintaining, okay, clearing track, these are all the attack phases, okay. Then comes the documentation. So gaining access means you get access. Command and control, I just 
told you in the previous cyber calcium methodology. Now I am inside the system, I am getting data from that particular victim system, right. Maintaining access, I should not come outside. Uh, I am inside the back door, okay. So I should stay, how they will do is, uh, in your windows you would have seen the command prompt. So usually what people will do using Kali Linux is they will try to get an unauthorized entry inside that particular target system through the shell prompt, this command prompt, okay. So they will go to the particular IP address for example 192.168, okay, 51.102, this is the IP address of the target victim. So they will try to get inside and then see all the files, change the directories, copy the files. Okay, so they will go inside certain directories. Okay, so for example, dir1 is the directory which I want to change. Okay, then I will give ls command. I will see all the files which are present inside the directory. Okay, and then I will copy a particular file. All this I will do in the prompt of that particular my machine. Okay, now if I am suddenly coming out of the prompt means I am not maintaining access. Until I am inside the prompt, I will be able to do all the operations. Okay. When you give exit, then only you are coming outside that particular machine. Yes or no? Till that you are maintaining the access inside the machine, right? So then you clear the track. Clear the track means there should be no history of what you have done before. Nobody should identify that what you have done. That is why people in the industry, they will maintain logs. Heard about this? Yes, right? So they try to check what all operations have been done in the past one hour by an administrator or by any user, they will maintain the logs. If you have logs, you can easily identify what are the malicious operations which has been done by the attacker. Remember I told you a tool called as Plunk and Solar Wind. these tools can do the log capturing activity for you. So industries will use these tools to monitor, to create the logs and to monitor the logs. Any abnormal event, they can identify using those tools. And automatically an email will go to the project manager telling that so and so event has happened. This is an abnormal event. If somebody is trying to get an unauthorized access, automatically an email will go. So we have 24 bar 7 monitoring tools. Okay. No more it is going to be manual. We have automated tools which can do the log generation activity and find out if somebody is doing this. This is all unauthorized access. Yes or no? So somebody can monitor, a tool will monitor and give you the result, right. So these are the five stages of ethical hacking. Now we will go, today we will focus on the first two phases because reconnaissance and footprinting and the scanning, that is the main focus of today's session, right. So reconnaissance and footprinting, uh, it is mainly used to gather information about a target, right? So there are two types of footprinting, one we call it as passive, another is called as Passive means I collect some information about you without your knowledge, that is called as passive. I collect some information about you with your knowledge, that is active, right. So means that you are no, uh, you have a website. Let me uh, tell you this question, you identify whether what type of footprinting is. I go to the website of a particular company, collect some information. What type of footprinting is this? This is passive. Because you don't, you, it is your website, anybody can go, anybody can collect the information. It need not be the target knows this form, who is the person who has visited this website and collected the information, right. Now, assume that I am sending a uh, social message in some social media platform and asking you to reply. So that is kind of active footprinting, right. You collect some information. In fact, any of the tools you use. It's an example of active footprinting because all the tools internally will send a packet to the target and then collect the information. So the target will know, okay, you are using the tool and you are sending me some uh, message to collect some information that will be an example of active reconnaissance. So just remember the two types of reconnaissance, passive without the knowledge of the target, active with the knowledge of the target, right. We will see some examples. So, so without establishing the contact between you and the pen tester and the target, right. So reaching out and touching the target, so just, just now I gave you an example, social engineering. In social media we try to contact the people, collect lot of information, 
right now where he is, is he away from his uh, office or home and collect lot of information. That is an example of active recognition, right. So, so now we have lot of tools to do this footprinting, right. See, NMAP, I think you had one session on NMAP or you have one session in the coming days, okay. See, NMAP, very important tool, you try to download and keep it ready. It is available uh, free for all the operating systems. You go to the official website of nmap.org. This is a very popular tool used for scanning. So nmap you can download and keep it. This will do lot of footprinting mainly with respect to port scanning for you. Okay. So there are other tools also. Sam Spade, Trace Root, Neo Trace. It is NS if you uh, and there is also another tool called as NS Lupus. It is NS if you try uh, if you download and keep this tool ready. Uh, I will give you some uh, introduction on NMAP today. Later on you will download and you will try to practice it in the NMAP. 